there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. Today we are going to paint this raven. It was a prompt for Inktober, and if you like this time lapse, I have a real time version of this lesson in Critique Club. I will have a link to that in the video description. It's $5 a month. It gives you access to over 60 more advanced real time narrated classes, and um, you can submit your own work for Critique every month. So check that out. Link in the video description if you want to learn more. We're starting off by sketching the raven, and I am using a uh, um, a water soluble pencil. It is a graphitant by Derwent and I'm using this kind of like inky blue color because um, well for one I knew it would pick up on the camera really well and also when I go to add water I can dissolve those lines and um, kind of get rid of my sketch. I really enjoy that because a lot of times I tweak my my drawing as I'm going through the painting process and I like that uh, that I can kind of like fuss it and move it around a little bit. So I wanted to have, um, I'm kind of just creating a scene from my imagination here, and I wanted to have like a big moon, and I'm using these scrapbooking templates to kind of figure out where I want to put it. So I want this kind of like really big um, orangey yellow harvest moon. So I just decided to trace that in on the right upper side of the paper to kind of um, make uh, the, the composition balanced and bring the eye throughout the painting. And what I'm doing here is actually taking some salt water and painting the sky area. And the reason I'm using salt water is because I want to have a really beautiful textured effect in the sky. And um, salt water helps. Um, well, I have hard water where I live, so and we have well water. So using um, adding salt to your water will soften it, but it'll also enhance the look of granulation if you're using pigments that want to granulate. And um, if you look at that palette that you see on screen there. I made a video about this palette. I went through and I chose um, colors from my tube stash of watercolors and I chose the most granulating ones and I put them in a palette and I can set that palette inside of my larger studio palettes or alongside one of my smaller tins of watercolors so I could um, get these really beautiful textured washes when I want to put in a big background. And I chose this palette because it has really big wells and I can get a big brush in there. Um, so I will link to that video. I just posted it last week if you want to know what colors I chose and um, how you could go about using the paints you have to create a nice granulating palette of colors. If you want to do that. Um, I am into that granulating colors. Now I used a, a Schmincke Cobalt Blue Deep. Um, I think I used a little bit of lavender, some mineral violet. I also added some Prussian Blue into that because I just wanted some kind of like deep moody colors. Um, Prussian Blue wouldn't, well some, it can granulate a little bit. It's not a really granulating color, but as long as you have um, at least one color that granulates well, it could be an ultramarine blue, um, it will give that effect to your other colors as well. It'll, it'll um, overall give you that effect. Now, in order to have that effect, you need to have a lot of water because you want that pigment, those uh, pigment particles to settle aside and just kind of uh, float and separate. And um, then I just went around the edges with a rag to soak up any puddles so I wouldn't get backwashes on the edges of my painting. So when you have such a, a wet wash like this, you have to be aware that if you paint something else next to it really wet, the colors are going to seep together. They might blur or they might even just bleed into each other. But because it's a night scene, I didn't really want a crisp definition between the sky and the um, and the land. So I decided to go ahead and just go. I'm going in on dry paper here, uh, but I am using a pretty juicy paint. And I'm adding in different shades of greens and yellows. Um, to create this uh, this land area. And I'm going to darken that up because I want it to be kind of nighttime. Now I know that I'm going to have some like oranges and yellows in the moon, so I want to put some of that in the ground as well to kind of show like um, the moonlight, that warm harvest moon colored moonlight kind of dancing across the field. Because I imagine this is like uh, this crow's on a post. It's kind of sitting on the edge of a field, I imagine. And then I'm throwing in some more greens, uh, some browns. I really want to darken that color up a bit and make it look a little bit more nighttimey and um, also just a little bit richer and a little bit spookier because you know I, I this is um one of my October paintings I want it to be a little bit like fallish and spooky and um, plus I just love ravens and crows we have crows here and I love to feed them and they are so smart and they will remember you if I go outside and I and I yell crows like that they will come because they know I'm putting some food out for them um, so so smart and ravens are really smart too I, I don't see ravens around here they do live in this 
this uh, climate, but um, I don't see them in my town so much, mostly crows. Crows and turkeys, lots of turkeys. Uh, so the, uh, the land color migrated a little more than I wanted it to up here into the sky, so I'm just mixing up a little bit more of those blues and um, having basically a battle of the paint here, <laughs> um, adding it in there so it can kind of force the other colors down. And then I'm bringing some of that into the shadow in just kind of the um, divots and hills into the kind of grassy area. I had to let that dry before I could proceed and it's gonna take a while. This is cotton paper, it's uh, Hannah Mule, the collection paper. And I had to let that dry completely before I went in to do the moon. And I think I let it dry overnight. Um, and it's important you just let it be and let it dry and try not to move it around too much. You want that paint to be undisturbed so it can settle and separate. Um, don't use a heat tool on it because you're gonna dry it too fast before it gets a chance to separate and you're gonna ruin some of that granulation look. Now here I started out with nickel titanate yellow and uh, then I added in some raw sienna and I'm adding a little bit of Bordeaux, cadmium Bordeaux in here and I'm using a variety of different brands. Um, so what I did honestly is I went through my stash and I compared swatches of different colors and I saw what colors were going to give me the best effect and that's how I pulled this palette together. If you go through your palette of colors, your set of tubes, you may find that you've got different pigments, different brands that granulate better and that's how you should determine what goes into your palette. But on the, um, on the video of that palette, I did leave a list of specific colors and brand names and pigment codes that I was using in case you want to find any of the exact colors I used. So I would just refer you back to that if you want to go a little bit deeper into the whole um, uh, granulation uh, topic. So now I'm also wetting the bird area since that's not touching anything that's wet currently I can begin to work on him and I'm using a new product for painting him. I got this um, paint from Renaissance. My friend uh, April has a shop on Etsy called A Little Creative and she stocks the Renaissance brand of paint which is a paint that she imports from Poland. I believe she's the only seller in North America and um, she asked me what I thought of this liquid charcoal and um, there's a, it's, you get a huge tube, it's like 60 ml, so it's like the size of an oil paint tube, and it is a water-based charcoal, um, and it's really nice, it's kind of, um, it got a neutral to cool undertone, it granulates beautifully, and you can mix it with other colors really well, so it's a cooler than, say, a lunar black or a Mars black, and it just has a beautiful texture to it. I think it would be really nice, too, if you want to use colored pencil on top, because it does seem to impart some physical texture to the paper. So I was trying that out so I could give her um, my thoughts on it and um, she is going to be stocking that. So I'll link that down below as well if you want to check it out. I might even have a coupon code to share. So look for that if you're interested. I'm also adding in some um, phthalo blue, actually no, Prussian blue and dioxazine violet because I used some of that in the sky. And I'm again going to be letting this layer settle out really well so that I can get some of that texture. But I thought that was kind of neat. There's a swatch of just that color dry. I know it was just there for a second, but I did decide to add that to my palette after I filmed the granulation video. So I just wanted to make a note of that. Um, you could also use a lunar black, you could use lunar blue, Mars black, anything like that that's got a nice texture to it. Um, although it's not as important with the Raven that you have uh, that texture like you do in the sky because you will be layering up some ink on top of that. Um, so a lot of that's going to get covered up, but it is kind of nice to have that underneath, I think. Now I'm mixing up some different browns and yellows here on the fence post that the bird is standing on. And I'm gonna let everything just kind of bleed together here. I'm not gonna worry about keeping any definition. I just wanted to get that yellow in there because that's where the moon is gonna be kind of like casting a bit of reflection. Now I let that dry completely and you can see his poor little feet just disappeared, but that's okay because we can put that back in. And I have uh, went out and got my um, acrylic inks out and ready. So with this uh, right here with the brush, I'm just putting in more of the liquid charcoal where I wanted the feet to be. Now, fun fact, I actually tried to make some charcoal watercolor with some powdered charcoal I had and gum arabic, and um, and I was so excited to make that, and it went completely moldy on me in like a day. So I was really happy that uh, this is a product that exists that I can just buy that doesn't have mold in it <laughs> because my DIY attempt did not work. So in case you got some powdered charcoal at home and you want to give it a try, I uh, totally give it a try, but I would only mix up what you need at a time for that painting because I use the um, liquid gum arabic and I never have a problem with that going moldy, but it did with that for some reason. So there must have been some organic matter in there that... Um, 
that just reacted. So just a word to the wise there. If you want to do that, mix up just what you need for a project. And um, as that's so messy though, that powdered stuff is so messy. I'm using this little flower palette and people ask me about this all the time. I bought it on Amazon and um, you, there's a couple different sellers there. I think it runs around 12 to $15 depending who's selling it. And I have it on my favorite, my favorites list if you want to check it out. Um, mine came from the shot, the store Meaden but there's um, different sellers sell it anyway. And I like it for inks because it's got a bunch of small, deep like um, uh, divots in there that you can put the color in. Now, another tip I wanna share is that um, if you, like leave your acrylic ink in there and it dries up on you, you can reconstitute it with alcohol and you can also clean your palette with alcohol. So if you have some left over and you just need a little touch more and you don't wanna, you know, just put some alcohol in there, stir it in, you should be able to reactivate it. Another tip I wanna share has to do with those bottles of iridescent ink. These are all Dr. P.H. Martin iridescent and Dr. P.H. Martin acrylic inks. Um, with the iridescent inks, they have so much mica. It's like almost half mica. There's tons of it in there, but it's really heavy and it settles out. So what I do is I keep a barbecue skewer right in my drawer where I keep all those inks. And um, I just, uh, I don't even bother with shaking them anymore. I unscrew the cap and I stir them. I, mean, I, I could shake it later on in that day, but um, if you haven't used it in a day or two, you gotta, you gotta put a barbecue skewer in there and just stir it up really good. Um, otherwise you'll be shaken till the cows come home. It is just, it's a lot of mica, uh, but they give you a beautiful result. They're super opaque and uh, super shimmery, very beautiful inks. And I've had these for quite a few years and they're still going strong. Nothing has um, been ruined or dried up on me. It's worked really well. Now with this little um, dip pen here, this is a cow quill pen. pen. I'm using the um, matte black acrylic ink from Dr. Paige Martin, and I am just going in and adding some details. Because sometimes when you go in with the iridescent inks, it can get get to be a bit much, or you're having this smooth, opaque, very shiny product on top of this very matte and gritty um, textured base layer. And um, it can look a little bit like, uh, it's just too much contrast. Going in with a matte black ink like this, it's kind of like it bridges the gap. So it's not as matte as the watercolor, but it's not as shiny as the iridescent. So it's kind of like a mid-step and I could go in there and just, um, uh, add those kind of those darks that are um, not shiny basically so it just it just worked really well to pull this bird together I think and then you can layer in some more of the acrylic ink as needed and um, just kind of keep working back and forth until you feel like it is um, it feels natural and balanced and uh, with a blackbird it can be very difficult to paint an animal that is black because a lot of times you can't see the subtlety you can't see the nuance you can't see the highlights um, what I do if I have a photograph of a black animal is I will open it up in my just my Windows photo viewer nothing fancy and I increase the um, the either the exposure or I just kind of click the filter button and I go to, to bring up the shadows a little bit so I can see the details um, because oftentimes everything just gets completely compressed in um, all blacks and whites get compressed in photo photography so being able to kind of pull up those nuances in some photo editing software can really help you see what's really there instead of it just looking like a black hole in a painting. So definitely, uh, definitely brighten stuff up like that so you can see your details. The pen worked really well with the inks. Um, I did find a brush work better for the feathers and the iridescent inks, but when you want those fine details, just, um, this is a speedball. I think it's called a cow quill nib and just a regular speedball drawing nib worked really well. And I believe they come in the same set. Um, I had a set and it had two holders. It had the holder for the cow quill and it had a holder for your regular calligraphy nibs. Um, and it wasn't that expensive. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was under $10 um, and they're pretty easy to come by. So, you know, if you need a pen, I, I wouldn't get anything too fancy. I like cheap pens because then I, I just like spray them with rubbing alcohol and wipe them off when I'm done. And that seems to keep them in pretty good working order. And I added a little more detail to the stump because it looked a little too light. I added some shadow with some paint and, um, you know, just kind of uh, worked on it a little bit that way. Now this part of the painting is not for the faint of heart. And I'm telling you what, I was a little worried about ruining it 
at this step. I knew I needed something else. This was just too stark. And I love the idea of either a bunch of crows or a bunch of bats just kind of flying across the moon. And so I just grabbed one of those pens and uh, this is one of the, just the regular drawing or calligraphy pens. Um, I guess it's drawing because it's got a small point and it just dipped, dipped right into the black matte ink and started sketching bats. And um, I didn't want to have them all be kind of cliche cartoon bats. So I wanted to draw them in different um, poses and I wasn't sure how many I was going to put down. I wasn't sure how, like how much of the background I wanted to cover up with them, but I just knew I needed something both for movement and energy and, um, life in the piece. And so I just went for it. And there were a few times where I'm like, oh, have I made a huge mistake? Because there was no taking them out. Once you put them in there, I can't remove them. There's no undo button. This is, you know, for all the marbles, but I really like how it came out. And um, it's actually fun to watch it back now because I know it turned out okay, but I'm telling you what, guys, when I was doing this, I was a little bit afraid that I was going to mess it up. Now, I like using the pen for sketching because you do get a small line, but um, the pen is not going to be great for filling in the shapes. So just a small acrylic paintbrush will work really well for this. So I, when I use acrylic ink, I use the same kind of um, rule of thumb as if I was using acrylic paint. So I will use my acrylic paint brushes. The only exception to that is if, um, is if I'm doing something where I need a special effects brush because I will use my special effects brushes across different media, such as my foliage brushes. Um, I'll use those for acrylics as well as watercolor. You can't really hurt them. And also I have some really long sword uh, liners that I will use for acrylic ink as well as watercolor because the bristles are so long, I know I'm not gonna get ink up in the ferrule and potentially damage that brush. Also the bristles are so long, they're gonna come back together to a point by the end anyway. So um, I'm not so worried about that. But other than that, my watercolor brushes are watercolor only um, and that makes them last for years and years and years. I rarely have to replace a brush. Uh, some of these, I have like two of these Creative Markman mix that I've been using for like, I don't know, eight years and um, a couple of them have started to go blunt and the, the smaller sizes like the number four, which was never a really pointy one to begin with. And I think I have one of my number ones that, um, that has started to go blunt, but um, they're still useful. They're still usable. They just don't have as sharp of a point. So that would be a big tip that I would share with you if you're a mixed media artist, still keep your watercolor brushes for watercolor only. Um, you can use your watercolor with your acrylic brushes, but don't use acrylics with your watercolor brushes unless it's like a specialty brush, like a foliage brush or a deer foot stippler or a, uh, um, oh, you know, like a sore, like a long sword liner, even dagger brushes. I would keep my, I would keep my watercolor ones separate, but, um, yeah, these acrylics are really tough on brushes. I find that my acrylic brushes are the only ones I actually need to replace the, uh, my oil painting brushes last perpetually pretty much. Uh, even if you've got oil paint that's dried onto your brushes, you can usually rescue them with brush soap. So acrylics is, I think, the hardest material for brushes. Um, and I have a set of, once my kids use my acrylic brushes once, those became my kids' acrylic brushes. And they've got this big bucket of brushes, that is theirs. And um, I don't have to worry about it because I just know that, I mean, kids especially are hard on brushes. I was when I was a kid. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind as you're going about. Now, if you do have old acrylic brushes, you can use them for special effects in like oil paints and um, things like that. So I wouldn't necessarily toss them because they're usually useful for something, but um, you know, just, just keep, keep that in mind as you're, as you're working. This is just a small acrylic brush I'm using for these uh, the details on the birds. Now, uh, the bats rather. Now, one thing I do also want to I mentioned why I use a pen instead of a brush, even if it's a fine tip brush, because a brush holds a lot more paint or ink than a, um, than a pen will. So you, sometimes you get a blob. It's like that the brush is fine enough to control it, but that blob, it just gives you too much ink at once. So what I'm doing here is I'm using some Derwent drawing pencils just to add some shadow under the, um, under the claws here. And I'm also just adding some detail into the stump using some, uh, wheat, which is kind of like a warm yellow ochre cream color, uh, yellow ochre. And just like, uh, I think it's called chocolate Brown and black just to, um, get those earthy tones. I love the Derwent drawing pencils. They are, I think one of the best values for a light fast pencil. It's, it's just a neutral range of 24 colors, but they're such beautiful colors. Great for figure drawing, great for a wildlife. I highly recommend them. Very robust and sturdy pencils. Um, haven't had any breakage issues and they sharpen really well. They just have a slightly larger barrel than like your typical colored pencil. So you may need a separate pencil sharpener if your pencil sharpener doesn't do the larger barreled pencils.
Here I'm using an acrylic ink called Nickel to do the um, barbed wire here on the fence and I probably should have taken a little more time to space out the barbs a little bit more evenly so I do regret that however I'll show you how I fixed that in a few seconds. Um, I did go in there with a paper towel to pick up a big blob of ink that had dropped and then I realized I liked the way that looked so I dropped big blobs of ink on all the other barbs and just kind of let them spread out a little bit because I thought that looked kind of um, organic and I liked the rhythm of it and I thought it was kind of um, it was kind of fun so that's what I did there. Now the next thing I am going to do is add some stars in the sky so I don't want to cover up much of the background so I'm just using a liner brush and some silver acrylic ink and I'm just dabbing in the stars. Um, I think that goes and adds another layer of texture, adds another layer of interest, and I'm just really having a great time painting this. Now I want to have a few stars that would twinkle, and so um, I'm randomly taking a few of the larger blobs and just dragging up, down, left and right lines, and just kind of giving them a little bit of, of sparkle. To me this kind of looks like something that would be... Um, like on the on the cover of a Halloween book or, or something like that, maybe a, a Halloween mass-produced card, I don't know, it just kind of has this illustrative quality that I like, or maybe a calendar. This would be a cool like October um, calendar page, I think. It's just, and I'm just having so much fun with it. So uh, maybe one day I will do a calendar of my work and, uh, <laughs> and that will be October, who knows. Um, I think up all kinds of ideas, <laughs> but I find that if I don't act on my ideas right away, then I'm really not that excited about it and they usually don't go much further <laughs> than that. Are you like that or do you need to think about your ideas? I find the longer I wait, the longer I think, the less likely I am to do it. I'm a jumper. I'm a jumper, friends. I gotta jump right in. So now I'm using a mixture of the matte black and some olive green acrylic ink and I am using that long sword liner, my watercolor liner that I told you about, that because it's a long you know, sword liner, I will use it with the acrylic ink and wash it out really good with my brush soap. Um, I can't, I just, I hate to see people ruin their brushes, so I know I probably sound like a broken record when I talk about brush maintenance, but you know, I don't, I don't want you to ruin your brushes. They can be expensive. Um, and I'm using the olive and the black together because I want it to be dark. I want that kind of silhouette look, but I still want it to have a little bit of that undertone of green. I don't even know if the undertone is showing up in the video so much, but I believe it adds a bit of a warmth that I can see even in the video replay here. And uh, I really am enjoying the way that comes out. I wasn't sure if I like the grasses behind the post or not. Um, so if you don't, then don't put them in on yours. But generally, um, I don't know, I, I like to have like, grasses around posts and things like that. I think it just fills it in and makes it look natural and really looks farmy if you've ever grown up around farms. But there you have it. That pretty much does it for this project. I hope you enjoyed it. It was so much fun to paint and I thank you so much for spending part of your day with me. Be sure to check out Critique Club if you would like a real-time version of this project. I'll link it down below. It's five dollars a month and I'd love to have you as a member. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, happy crafting!